the one was a, an artist. He was a designer, a very talented individual. He used to work with precious metals. And one day, he gets a message that the king would like to speak to him. And in trepidation, he goes stepping off to the palace. And the king calls him in. And the king says to him, I hear that you're a very talented artisan. And I would like to commission you to make for me a royal goblet, a royal abeha, what do we call I'll provide you with the material, and you spend time making this becha, this goblet. <coughs> and of course, the artist was very pleased with this commission, and the king said to the minister of the treasury, go with Yankel, let's call him, go with Yankel, provide him the goods, and in one year, I would like you to present this becha, this golden goblet, this beautiful artist, artistic piece. So Yanko goes off with the treasurer, the king of the, the uh, minister of the treasury, and they go off into the king's treasury, and he goes rummaging around, and he gives him a block of gold, and a block of silver, and a small bag of diamonds, and a small bag of rubies and precious stones, and he takes out his ledger, he opens up the ledger, and he writes down the material that he gave him, and he says, listen, he says, we're putting you on a retainer. We don't want you to be busy with anything else. Your job is to make the king's goblet. And we will pay you a hundred thousand dollars a month for this avoider. <laughs> this artist can't believe his luck. You know, barely he can scrape together five thousand dollars. A hundred thousand dollars a month is an obscene sum. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's thrilled. And he says, yes, sure. And if you do a good job, at the end, we'll give you a bonus. Off he goes home, comes into the house, dancing into the house. He says, Golda, we're rich, we're rich. And he tells her the whole story, and she's very, very excited. He says, listen, pack your bags, we're going on a cruise. Remember the cruise I promised you? Well, now's our chance, we're going on a cruise. And he goes, quickly orders tickets, first class on this cruise ship. Ah, Mama Shigevald, never had such an opportunity. They go off on a cruise, they have a wonderful time. They come back home, he goes into his workshop, and he starts <coughs> patchkering around with his, uh, with his gold and his silver and his diamonds. After a few minutes, the money is burning a hole in his pocket. He comes to Golda and he says, you know, we've never been to Hawaii. Let's go to Hawaii. <laughs> so off they go to Hawaii, and of course they have a wonderful time. They invite a few friends, $100,000 can be well spent. Anybody knows how. And off they go to Hawaii, and this goes on every day and every week. There's a different... Uh, <laughs> Hashem, there's lots of entertainment in this world. And week follows week, and every so often Yanko goes into his workhouse and he does a little bit more with his betha over here. But, listen, the money is, you know, by now it's already, he's received already three paychecks and the money is burning a big hole in his pocket and he needs to spend it. And the friends are coming and the friends are going and they're chartering airplanes and they're going all over the world to the Alps and down to New Zealand and they're trying everything and all the tivus and all the hanois and all the pleasures and all the travels and anything we can imagine they're spending the money on. After a little while, a hundred thousand dollars is not enough. And uh, Yankel is getting a little bit tight. So he goes into his safe and he takes out the bag of diamonds and he looks at the diamonds and he thinks, 25 diamonds? Who needs 25 diamonds in a goblet? I'll take a few. Takes a few diamonds, goes and pawns them off and now he's got a little bit more money. After a little while, that runs out. So he takes a sliver of gold, and he sells the sliver of gold. Then it becomes a bigger sliver of gold, and then it becomes a few rubies, and weeks follow weeks, and months follow months, until one day, there's a knock on the door. The uncle rolls out of bed quickly, gets dressed, goes to open the door, and the king's treasurer is standing. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, he says, uh, how are you doing, the uncle? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Everything is good. Fine, fine. Everything is fine. H how's the becha coming along? It's coming along great. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. I'm just here to remind you that you have one month left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One month left. Sure, sure. Quickly, closes the door. He comes in and he says, Golda, 
one month left. I haven't, I haven't gotten any. He says, that's it, the party's over. Send everybody home, close all the doors. I'm going to work on the Becha. He goes, locks himself up in his workroom, closes the door, takes out the safe, and he looks at the materials. And they're depleted. There's hardly any gold. There's hardly any silver. There's but a handful of diamonds and a few rubies. What's he going to do? He's, he's afkak the Taurus, as they say. What's he going to do? He thinks, what can I do? If I go now and I own up, I'm for sure going to get punished severely. I'll do the best I can. I'll do the best I can. And he sits and starts working on this becha. Now, he's a good artist. He creates a masterpiece, an absolute masterpiece. The way that he, he sets the gold with the silver and the way that he engraves it and the way that he sets the few little stones that he has left, it's a masterpiece. And he works on it night after night and day after day. He's got to do the best that he can. The last night, Fashtetzach, he's up all night and he goes and he wakes up, he gets up in the... doesn't get up, actually. He's up all night and he goes in the morning and off he goes to the king's palace. <coughs> he's wrapped the Becher up nicely. And, of course, the king has uh, invited all the ministers and everybody's there. The whole, the entire king's court is there to see how Yankel, the famous artist, what sort of masterpiece has he come up with, the amount of money invested in this golden goblet for the king. And Yankel comes stepping up to the king and he hands him over the package with the becher. The king unravels the package. This is a year's worth of work and he holds up the goblet. And it's stunning. Everybody's mouths gape open. Wow, what a piece of art. Beautiful, stunning. And Yankel, oh, oh Hashem. The king turns round to the treasurer and he gives him the goblet and he says to him, go with Yankel and take care of what needs to be taken care of. The treasurer goes off with the uncle to the treasury. He sits him down and says, wow, beautiful masterpiece over here. Now we have to finish uh, calculating what it is that we have to do. And he takes out his ledger, takes out the ledger, and he opens the ledger, and he says, okay, so I gave you this, and we promised this, and let me take a look. He looks at the becha, and he looks at the ledger, and he says, hold on a minute. Some diamonds missing here. There's some rubies missing here. Wait a second, he pulls out a scale, and he puts the becha on the scale, and he says, not the same weight that I gave you. I gave you more weight. He grabs him by the scruff of the neck and he takes him straight to the king and he says to the king, Yankel is a gallop. He's taken from the king. And the king turns around to Yankel and he says, how could you do that to me? I trusted you. Look what I gave you. I gave you so many things. And Yankel gets down on his knees and he begs the king and he says, please, he says, give me another chance. Give me the same materials. Give me the same contract. And I promise you, I'll make you a becha. This will be nothing compared to what I can do for you. This is nothing. Every year, the Rabbeinu Shlaylam gives us an allotment of goods. Talents, abilities, capabilities, family, shul, community. <laughs> and the job is to spend the year using that which the Rabbeinu Shlaylam gave us and creating a becha for the Rebbein Shalom, creating a masterpiece for the Rebbein Shalom. And unfortunately, we eat into the capital. As the year goes on, we eat a little bit here and we slice off a sliver over here. We have a few more days left. We have time. We're going to stand in front of the Rebbein Shalom. What's our becha going to look like? What is our becha? going to look like. The problem is, our, or should I say the difficulty is, the difficulty is that we're stuck. We're stuck. We're stuck in our ways. We are eingewöhnt, as we say in Yiddish. This is the way we've been. This is the way I'm going to be. There's a uh, story told about a certain individual lived in a village and and he, uh, he needed to make a parnosa, and he had no way of making a parnosa. So he decided he's going to go to the big city. And he's wandering around the big city, he becomes an apprentice by a baker. He becomes an apprentice by a baker, he learns the trade of baking, makes a little bit of money. And after a little while, he decides it's time to go back home. Go back home, his wife has been living at home, probably borrowing money. And he's gathered up a little bit of money over the year that he worked, and he's going back home. A little bit of money. On the way home, he gets uh, hijacked. My robber. 
And the robber puts a gun to him and he says, Give me your money. Your money or your life. Say so he hands him over the money. Uh, as the uh, robber is about to get off on his horse and drive off, he says to him, the baker says to him, do me a favor. He says, look, I've been away from home for a year. I'm going to come home. I'm going to tell my wife. I'm going to come home empty-handed. I'm going to tell my wife, really, I worked as a baker, but all my money was stolen from me. She's not going to believe me. Right? So he says, do me a favor. Look, I'm going to take my coat off. Okay? We'll put it on a tree. Shoot the coat. Make it look like you shot at me. And at least it looks authentic. So, the highway robber, he's a nice guy, he says, okay, you know, we'll humor him. So they hang the coat up on a tree, and the, the, the guy goes and he puts a shot through the coat. And uh, the baker says, yeah, yeah, it's not in a good place, put, put another one just a little bit below. Sh shoots another one there. He says, do me a favor, just one more, like towards the legs, you know, like as if I was running away. Just put another shot there. He puts another shot there. He goes, and, and one more through the left shoulder. So I'm sorry, I, I'm out of ammunition. Out of ammunition, poof, 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 knocks him down to the ground, pummels him, he takes away his money, and he starts walking off. <laughs> so the, uh, the highway robber turns around to him and he says, Not only did you beat me, but you take my money too. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on over here? What's going on? A, a thief is convinced that the money that he takes, it, it's his. It's his money. That's the power of getting used to something. When you get used to a thief gets used to something, that's what he gets used to. Go and, 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 ira and, and uproot that middle. Go and uproot that middle. That's the difficulty. We see things from our own perspective. <coughs> another another maestro that, uh, that I saw was, was um, the Stachina Rebbe was once sitting with a, with a group of Chassidim. And there was an elderly Jew there whose father owned uh, stables. Now, the historians amongst us may, may, be, uh, may uh, expound on this, but in the olden days, people traveled from city to city with a horse, and the horse got tired. So what did you do when the horse got tired? There were stations where you could switch horses, right? You used to drop off your horse, borrow a horse, and on your way back, you switched it, something to this effect. And this fellow, this Yid, his father owned such a stable, and he was sitting there, he was an elderly gentleman, and they were sitting and schmoozing about the old times, and he pipes up and he says, I remember Reb Meisha. Reb Meisha was, was the Stachina Rebbe's grandfather. And all the old Hasidim says, you remember Reb Meisha? You remember the Rebbe Zayda? Wow, tell us, tell us. So he goes, yeah, I remember I was a little boy. I was in Cheda. And we heard that Reb Meisha was coming to town. And they took all the Cheda Ingalach and they dressed us all in Shabbos clothes. And they gave us uh, these torches. You know, anybody been to Achnasus Evater in Al-Tisrael? Yeah, they have the little kids and they walk with these, with these torches to welcome the Sefer to come in. They gave us these torches and we lined the streets waiting for the Rebbe to come. No, 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 what happened? And he says, yeah, remember the, we heard the carriage coming down from, from the, down the street into the town. Yeah, 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 so the Rebbe says, yeah, what, what did you see? Ah, I never saw such beautiful horses. Ah, such beautiful, beautiful horses. The Rebbe, what about the Rebbe? I, I don't remember the Rebbe. I remember the horses. Yeah, that, that's the vision, that's the narrowed vision of a child who grows up in a, in a house where the father is a, is a sta basically a stable hand. Right? And that's, that's the narrow vision. There's some South Africans here, right? Yeah? I was, when I was younger, oh, when I was younger, so uh, we, were in, we went to camp in Cape Town. So we took the train from Johannesburg to Cape Town. Not the blue train. Anybody who knows what that is, it was not the blue train. We were in cattle class. And, um, and we, you know, kids, as kids, everything is an experience. So we're sitting on the train, and all of a sudden the, the, the door opens, and there's a fellow coming in, wheeling a, a, a trolley. He's selling snacks or serving snacks. So you hear him coming down from, from the other end of the carriage, and he's wheeling his trolley, and he's going, tea, coffee, tea, coffee, coffee, tea, tea, coffee, tea, coffee, coffee, tea. And somebody says, uh, somebody says, I'll have a cup of coffee. So he says, sorry, no coffee. And then he carries on walking, tea, coffee, tea, coffee, coffee, tea, tea coffee. <laughs> what are you doing? You don't have any coffee. But he's, this fellow's been plying the, the route of the, of the aisles in this train for the past 20 years, 
right? And he says, tea coffee, tea coffee. That's what he said. That's what he is. He's holding in one schwung. He's just plodding along his life, right? Without looking right or left. He's just coming along. He's just coming along. Uh, you know, and, and we're all like that. We're all the same. Um, one time, I was in, I was in, I learned in Gateshead Yeshiva in England, and I was sitting in the front of the Beis Medrash, and it struck me uh, something phenomenal. Sitting in the front of the Beis Medrash, and it was before davening, and there's a, there's a, uh, there's a safer on the desk. There's a long, long desk, and there's a safer on the desk. And an individual <coughs> walked in, and I remember who it was, he was the head of the Vada Yeshivas. Uh, head of, a, of an, org an organization of, of yeshivas. The Vada Yeshivas at one time used to publish Svarim. Anyway, he walks in and, and he sees the safer on the desk and he picks up the safer and he looks at the safer and he goes like this. Puts it down. Right? And a few minutes later, the yeshiva binder, the book binder of the yeshiva comes in. And he walks past the safer and he sees the safer and he picks up the safer and he goes like this. Right? And he puts it down. Uh, you know, my grandfather's a paper merchant, he deals in paper. So I think to myself, my grandfather was there, I see the way he picks up the books, he goes like this. He's feeling the paper, to see the quality of the paper, the thickness of the paper, right? And then, it's a few minutes before davening, and one of the good boys in yeshiva comes in. And he looks at the watch and he sees this few more minutes, and he looks at the safe and he opens the safe and he sits down to learn. Because all of us, right, we all approach things the way we used to approach things. So we're stuck, this is, this is where we are. So, what could we do? I'm stuck, this is the way I am. Coffee, tea, coffee, tea. How am I, gonna, how am I ever going to change? Rav Desla has a mimer. Rav Desla says, in the mimer called Koichoi Shal Mabata Emes. He says, how is it possible for us to be subjective? If we're so ingrained in our ways, how is it possible? And he says there's a chesed of the Rebbein Shalem, a kindness of the Rebbein Shalem. He did not give permission to the Yetzirah to completely cover over the truth. But there is a point, there is a point that we can all access that is left pristine. And that's the point that we must focus on to change. The Derech Emes is in that point. We have to change. How do we change? So in the in the words of a famous Chinese philosopher, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Right? This is a really a, a he was machavan to something a lot greater. Everybody knows the famous story of Rabbi Kiva, right? Rabbi Kiva, the Maisel with Rabbi Kiva, Ma'oyot, Chilososh, Rabbi Kiva, what was the beginning of Rabbi Kiva? He goes down to the water and he sees that the, the water that's been dropping on this rock has managed to erode the rock. And he says, the same way the water which is soft has the ability to erode rock, so too Torah, which is Nimshel Lamaim, obviously can change my lave bustle, my hearty heart, my, my fleshy heart. Chazal tell us, Chazar lil Torah. What does that word mean? Chazar lil meter. Chazar lil meter. We have, an, we have a, an, an image of Rabbi Kiva that he was an Amoret till the age of 40, and he went back at the age of 40 and he learned Aleph Beis. Says Rabbi Sal Salanta from this duke, he says it's Chazar lil meter. He'd been there, but he gave up. He'd been in Yeshiva, he'd been through the process, and he gave up because it was too difficult for him. So what changed? What did he see? So I heard a, a paraphrase of what Ruby Stroll says. He said, take, take a big, huge, gigantic bucket, right? And capture that water that's been dripping on that rock over 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? Capture all that water, okay? Then take that big bucket and in one fell swoop, turn it upside down onto the rock. What's going to happen to the rock? Nothing. There will be no change. Says Rabbi Sral Salanta, you know what Rabbi Kiva figured out when he saw that water dripping on the rock? Two things he figured out. A tipping, tipping, drip, drop, drip, 
drop slowly but surely, consistently. It is about consistency, that's what it is. If we are ongoing and consistent in that which we implement as change, then it will actually affect us. That's the lesson to be learned from Rabbi Kiva's Meissen. In fact, um, this is not just Chinese philosophy, but modern psychology. Obviously, I can't help not speaking about modern psychology. Modern psychology also shows, studies show that, uh, in fact, there's a, there's a very interesting book for, for anybody who's interested, it's called The Brain That Changes, it, Changes, The Brain That Changes Itself, by a fellow called Norman Deutsch, who has a whole, whole host of different um, situations that he speaks about, where the brain has been studied, but it, actually the structure of the brain changes as a result of certain therapies. Loyal Lane people who suffer a stroke and they, uh, they un, un, undergo uh, um, the, the therapy process that they undergo, the brain actually has the ability to change. And that change happens over time with consistent therapy. It's not only physical therapy that changes the brain, but actually if a person has, is used to a certain way of thinking, can actually shift the way the brain thinks about things by thinking differently about things. So we have the ability to change. <coughs> but we need some aiders, we need some advice. Where, what, what do I do? Where do I start? Where do I begin? The Gemara in Menachos tells us a, a, a marshal of a king um, who, who asked two of his uh, ministers <coughs> or two of his artists to create for him a seal. A seal! You know, like in the olden days, they used to seal documents with a seal. He told one, you make me a seal out of gold, and another one he told him, make me a seal out of plaster. Come back in a month and deliver it to me. A month later, they were both negligent, didn't, didn't do their job. Who gets the bigger punishment for not doing the job? The fellow who was supposed to make the golden seal, or the fellow who was supposed to make the plaster seal? Plaster. Don't all shout out at once. Plaster. The plaster, plaster. why? Because it's easier. Because it's easier. It's much easier to make a... We've all been to the plaster playhouse, either ourselves or with our children, right? It's easy to make something from plaster. It's far more difficult to make something from gold. You need to be a real artist to make something out of gold. So the responsibility, says Ruby Sroll, at this current stage of our year, right, when we're trying to change things, is to start with the easy things, the things that are small, the things that are easy for us. A brocha before you eat something. Kavon in the first pasuk in Krishna. Being nice to the people around us, being nice to somebody, being, just being pleasant, being, uh, it's an important thing. Relationships with our families, maybe it's hard, but it's constant and it's there the whole time. We have the ability to do that. Rabbi Sral Salanta has a very, uh, 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 used to say, used to say like this. Sral Salanta used to say, the world is a very expensive hotel. The world is a very expensive hotel. And his Talmudim, each one in his own way, went and explained what it is that he meant by to say. That the world is a very expensive hotel, and a person can eat up his Elam Haba with a bowl of compote. A bowl of compote is two different gasas, either a bowl of compote or a, bo of a, po or a plate of tzimus. I guess it depends on where you came from, right? A person can eat up his whole Elam Haba, uh, his whole Elam Haba, by eating up a bowl of compote. What did he mean with this? So the Alta from Kelm explained it like this. Fellow walking down the street and he, uh, and he walks past, let's say, the Royal York, okay? Or you, ha you have to be in whichever town you're in, right? In London it's a different hotel, in New York it's a different hotel, the Waldorf Astoria, I don't know. Anyway, he's walking past the hotel and he thinks, what a magnificent place. What a magnificent place. I have to go in here. I have to go in here. I have to see what it's like. And he goes into the hotel and he wants a room for the night. And they say to him, a room for the night in this hotel is $20,000. $20,000. Can't afford $20,000. So he says he's going to hang around a little bit. He's going to hang around a little bit. He walks around. He sees a few restaurants. So I can't afford a room. Maybe I can afford something to eat. So he goes into the restaurant. He looks up at the menu. and <laughs> You know, a steak is $300. Right? He can't afford to eat here either. So uh, he sits there in the lobby. He sits there in the lobby. And there's a fellow walking around over there. And he, he strikes up a conversation with him. And, uh, and he says, he says to him, you know, this hotel is such a 
glorious, magnificent hotel. But uh, it's amazing to me how anybody can afford to be here. And they carry on the conversation. He, he says, where do you stay? He says, I, I stay here. Said, really? And where do you eat? He says, to him, he says, well, you know, I eat from the food that they serve here in the restaurants. Says, really? You must be fabulously wealthy. He says, no, I, I, I'm not, actually. I'm the waiter. Right? I, I get paid to be here. She, he says, you live here, you eat here, and you get paid? Unbelievable. Why is it that the waiter gets paid to be there? Why is it that he eats there? Why is it that he stays there? Because he's there to serve everybody who comes into the hotel. So he gets everything he needs. What's his job? His job is to make the patrons of the hotel comfortable. To make them, to make their life pleasant for them. It's all, in, it's all in our attitude, it's all in our approach. I heard uh, um, Rabbi Saberman told, uh, told uh, uh, wonderful Meissner, he said that um, so there was a fellow who, who uh, used to buy a lottery ticket. Every week he bought a lottery ticket. Spent $10 on a lottery ticket. And one day he goes to check his lottery ticket and the machine plays in beautiful musical notes, whatever it does, I've never heard it. But <laughs> it, apparently that's what it happened. And, uh, and he, won, he wins the lottery, $25,000. Wow, he can't believe his luck. He got his mummy, she's so excited. And, uh, you know, he's, Baruch Hashem, he was davened already. He already thanked the Rebbe And, uh, and he's, he's, he's on his way home. He remembers he has a, a doctor's appointment. As a doctor's appointment. He puts the ticket in his pocket, right? He's going to go afterwards to, to, with his wife. He's going to tell his wife first. He's going to go and claim the money. But in the meantime, he goes to, to, to the doctor because he had an eye doctor's appointment already from a long time ago. Something was bothering him with his eyes. Goes into the doctor's appointment. The doctor checks his eyes, puts all these machines on his eyes to check his eyes. And he says to him, listen, he says, you've got a big problem. And he says, your eyes, they're on their way out. Because within a few months, you're going to lose vision. You're going to lose the vision. And he's, he's, he's <coughs> devastated. He's devastated. Doctor, there's nothing I can do. He says, not really. This is, this is a, it's a new area that nobody really has experience in. He says, there must be something, something I can do. He says, you know, I recently heard, actually, there's a doctor in uh, out of Polynesia who, who, uh, who can do an operation on your eyes. He says, really? I want to go, I want to go. He says, yeah, but it's... Uh, it's an expensive operation. He says, really? How much does it cost? $25,000. $25,000. It's a lot of money, $25,000. Right? Would he spend the $25,000 that he just won in the lottery on his eyes? Would he spend $25 million if he would win it on, in the lottery on his eyes? Would we? Would we? You walk into the lottery booth and it plays the music and you win $25,000. Would we, 25 million dollars, would we spend 25 million dollars to save our eyesight? Absolutely. We would. But do we appreciate our eyesight up to 25 million dollars? Do we have that appreciation? I'm talking to myself. Do we? Do we appreciate when we are holding our children in our hands and we're rocking them to sleep? Do we appreciate? What's the value? Can we put a price tag on rocking our children to sleep? Can we put a price tag on sitting for supper with our families? Can we put a price tag on being able to walk in the morning to shoot? Can we put a price tag on that? These are all the things that the Rebbe Shalom gave us. <coughs> this is what Rabbi Svar Salanta means. That the world is a very, very expensive hotel. Right? But, if we're waiters, if we are waiters in this hotel, then it's absolutely free. What do we mean? If we're here to make this experience, this worldly experience that we are, pleasant for those people around us, then we're provided with everything necessary in order to accomplish that goal. And it won't cost us a penny. All we have to do is instead of focusing on ourselves, we have to focus on the people around us. In a few, not so many hours from now, we're going to walk around the shul 
and we're going to wish each other a Lashana Toiva Tikosa Vesikosa. We're going to go home and wish our families a happy, healthy year. There's a Gemara in the Dorim that says the following thing. The Gemara says that if somebody dreams a dream that he was put in Nidui, that he was put in excommunication, Minashamayim, that the heavenly court put him in excommunication. So the solution to this problem is that you can't communicate with the heavenly court. It's a bit difficult until we get there. So what, how do you undo this, this revelation that you had you've been put into excommunication? So the Gemara says, here's an eight. Go find Asara Tamid Chachomim. Find ten Tamid Chachomim. They should be matir than you They have protection of the Tamid Chachomim. They have a connection. They can undo it. What happens if you can't find ten Tamid Chachomim? The Gemara has an eight for you. You know what the eight is? You know the, the suggestion the Gemara gives? Go stand on the street corner and say hello to the pe- to the passers-by. The Gemara actually says, say Shalom, right? Shalom, when you, when you meet another Jew, you say Shalom Aleichem. Shalom, what does the word Shalom mean? We translate it as peace. Maybe it means more than peace. Maybe we, we, we confuse peace with war, right? That's the opposite. But maybe it means serenity, comfort. What does Shalom actually mean? Peace, in, in the simple form of the word. So say hello to ten people. What's the purpose? I say hello to ten people, and what? So the Ran explains, the Ran says that what's going to happen when you say hello to somebody? He's going to answer back, right? He says that the ten people who will say hello to you, by the fact that they say shalom to you, it's going to be making you from Yisurim. It's going to protect you from any trials and tribulations that may have to come to you. Ten people saying shalom to somebody has the ability to protect them from Yisurim. That's the power of a greeting, of a simple greeting. There's a uh, beautiful Meisner said about Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld. He was the Rav in Yerushalayim many years ago. And it was, uh, this Meisner took place on the Motzeh Shabbos like, like our Motzeh Shabbos two, two nights ago, right? Mot- this past Motzeh Shabbos many years ago. So Rabbi Yosef Chaim was walking home from shul after Meir of Motzeh Shabbos and a Jew comes towards him and the Jew said to him, Agutavoch! which is the common greeting for Matzah Shabbos. Have a good week. And the common response in Yerushalayim is a good year, a good year. Why? Because when somebody gives you a bracha, you must always outdo the bracha that they gave you, right? A good vach, a good, a good week, a good year, a good year. And they carried on walking home. <coughs> and Yosef Chaim comes in, comes into the house, and the Rebetzin's got Abdullah prepared, and he, he stops. And he says, oh, I have to go out. And he goes out, and he goes walking over to this Jew's house that he just met on the street. Knocks on the door, the Jew opens the door, and then Yosef Chaim starts ladling with brachas, giving him a whole host of brachas. You should have a good year, and a healthy year, and you should be zeichet to be nechtav and chosim l'chaim toivim for the next year, and your family should be healthy, and a whole host of brachas. And he turns around to Rosh and he says, w- 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 what's all this about? I, I just met you on the street, we said hello nicely, everything's okay, w- w- what's going on over here? So Rabbi Yosef Chaim explains him like this. He says, you know, usually, when you say good vach, you say good year, so my bracha is bigger than yours, right? But today, tonight, when you said to me a good vach, that means a good week, which is seven days. I said to you a good yol, you might have thought that I thought a good yol was only three days. <laughs> <laughs> so it's shorter. <laughs> so I, I owe you more. I have to give you more. So I'm giving you a bigger bracha than you gave me. <coughs> First of all, you have to be a lamb. Yeah, you have to be a, a brilliant to be able to think of that even, right? <laughs> but not that you have to be brilliant. That an 80-year-old man should pick himself up in the middle of the night and walk over to somebody, oh, come on, chill out, as they say today. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, that bothers you. This is what you need to do. You're an 80-year-old man. Wait till you see him the next day in shul. The power of a simple greeting. The power of, of just a simple hello. I could tell, uh, I'll tell you another mice now. There's a mice uh, with the Tanza Rebbe. Okay, the Tanza Rebbe. So, uh, a fellow came in. One of the, a wealthy Jew from a certain village came into the Tanzareba. Shalom Aleichem Aleichem, Shalom, how are you? Good, Baruch Hashem, has business, everything is good. 
So the Rebbe says to him, you know, there's a Malamed in your town who's having a hard time putting together an Adunya for his daughter. He's having a hard time putting together money to marry off his daughter. How's he doing? So this, uh, this fellow said, I don't know. He says, w what do you mean you don't know? You live in the same town. How could you not know what's happening with him? He says, look, Rebbe, he says, I'm a very busy man. I have a big business, and the business takes up a lot of my time. Finish the business, I come home, I grab a bite to eat, and I go to the best marriage to learn. I, st I don't have the time. So the Rebbe says to him, ah, so, Mr. Tommy, you spend a lot of time in your spare time learning. You Mr. Tommy, you're a time with the I'm going to ask you a shayla. Ask you a kasha. It says in the Pasuk that, that when, when Yosef was wandering in the field, it says, Vayim tzoeyu ish, and a man found him and he was wandering in the field. Rashi says, who was this man that found him? It's the Malach Gavriel. So Rashi says it was the Malach Gavriel. Elsewhere it says, when the Malach fights with Yaakov, the Pasuk says that this Malach, it was an Ish. And Rashi says, who was the Ish? It was the Sarah Shal Esau. It was the angel of Esau. Both places says Ish. How does Rashi know? How does Rashi know that this Ish is the Malach Gavriel? And this Ish is the Sar of Esau? So the, the Gavir says, I don't know, Rebbe, you, you tell me. So the Rebbe says to him like this. When you bump into somebody in the field, and you're lost, and the fellow says to you, can I help you? Yes, I'm lost. And he says, well, the directions are this and this. That's a Malach Gavriel. That's a wonderful person. When you bump into somebody, Right? And you ask him for a bracha, right? Like the Pasuk says that it's Yaakov asking for a bracha, and he says, I'm sorry, I must run. Right? They're waiting for me up in Shemaim to sing Shira. You know, I, I have an appointment with the Rebbein Shalom, I've got to take care of myself. You know, this is my time for my Ruchnius now. So I'm sorry, I can't help you. That's an Esau. Even, even to take care of one's own Ruchnius, if it's at the expense of somebody else's Gashmius, that's an Esau. Right? So the, they say that a guy comes knocking on the door, right? Come uh, collecting for tzedakah. So the balabos says to him, you can't have any bitochen? Don't you have any bitochen? Why are you going collecting for tzedakah? Have bitochen, the Rabbani Shalom will give you. Yeah? Th there's, there's, a, there's a time where we have to respond <coughs> to the people that reach out to us just with helping them out. So, the Gemara says that the Gemara says that the there's a conversation that takes place between the Rabbein Shalom and Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu is asking the Rabbein Shalom for forgiveness for Klal Yisrael. The Rabbein Shalom gives them forgiveness, and then he gives Moshe a tip. He says, "Listen, whenever Klal Yisrael is in Tzal, whenever Klal Yisrael is in Saros and they need forgiveness, right? Then there's a process called the Shleishes the Midas, right? Hashem, Hashem, Kevrachem, Vachanan. We've been saying it every morning." And this is the process, it says, They should do this in front of me. Right? So what is this, doing this in front of the Rebbein Shalom? What does it mean? Well, it's what we do, right? We say, in the Slichas, we say, So then there's a problem. Textually, that's a problem. Because it shouldn't say, What should it, what should it say? Yagidu, Yikru, Yaimru, Lefonai, Say the Shleish is remitted. Chavetz Chaim explained, he gave an answer with the following marshal. He says there was once a, a, uh, a business uh, fellow, he had a business, business owner, and, um, and he had a thriving business. <coughs> he had a guy who was in charge, a second in command, who used to um, help him out in the store. And one day this fellow needed, the business fellow needed to go on a, on a trip. So he, he didn't know what, how he was going to go and leave the business, who was going to take care of the business, a second in command. So he says to him, look, I'm going away. And I want you to take care of the business. And I'm going to write out instructions, everything that needs to be done. From the minute you walk into the business in the morning till the minute the business is closed at night. Every step along the way is going to be written down. 9 o'clock, unlock the door. 9.03, turn on the light. 9.04, turn on the register, etc., etc., etc. Everything is going to be written out on the list. Can I trust you that you're going to read through the list and take care of the business? He says, yes, absolutely, you can trust. No problem. Oh, the guy picks up and he goes away on his trip. And he comes back a few weeks later, and the business is a complete mess. It's in complete disarray. And he says to me, but I, I gave you this. Did you read through the list? 
He says, yeah, I read through the list every single morning. I read through the list and I read it again and again. <laughs> In fact, I woke up early to read through the list. There's no point in just reading the list. You've got to do what it says in the list. Every morning we wake up, we say, Hashem, Hashem, Kev Rachum, V'chanu, Nerech, Apayim, V'ra, V'chesed, V'yemes. Is that the point? Just read the list? That's not the point. Mahu Rachum, Af'ato Rachum. Mahu Chanu, Af'ato Chanu. That's the point. The point is that the Rebbe Shem wants to, te to teach us this is how an individual becomes godly. An individual becomes godly by emulating the Rebbe Shalom's ways. If we were to emulate the Rebbe Shalom's ways, then we have the ability for great. And that's with being Rachum and being Chan. <laughs> that requires action, not words. So, we have a few days left, and we have to form our Becha. And sometimes we arrive, and we haven't even got a little Becha. We have nothing. And Rav Desla has a Maimon HaTshuva. Rav Desla in Maimon HaTshuva, he describes the true Avedis HaTshuva, like Rabbi Shaina said. True Avedis HaTshuva requires a lot of work. It requires working through the Shari Tshuva from the beginning of Al, if not earlier, and working through each and every single Nida that an individual has, and uprooting that Nida, feeling terrible, embarrassed, feeling pain at the fact that we've done Averis. I don't know about, maybe there are Sadiq in this room, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely don't, I, I can't. I can't, what can I tell you the truth? I cannot say that I absolutely feel the pain of the Averis that I do. I don't feel the pain of the Averis that I do. Maybe there are some people who can do this. This is called Tshuva Gadoyla. This is how Rav Desla describes Tshuva Gadoyla. And it's a great, great avoider. And a person who has the ability to do a Tshuva Gadoyla, he has the ability to uproot his Averis completely, and it's Keilu Yikrif Kalvan, and those Averis are gone. They're undone. There's another type of chuvah. There are many types of chuvahs that he describes in this mimer, and I urge everyone to <coughs> learn through this mimer. One of the chuvahs described in this mimer is chuvahktana. What's a chuvahktana? A chuvahktana is when you stand in front of the rabbi nishalayim and you say, and you recognize the fact that you're a balavera, and you stand in front of the rabbi nishalayim and you say, I know I'm a balavera. I know. But I can't. I can't. There's nothing I can do. I'm just. I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I have no kachos. And it's a tzaakas alev. It's a cry from the depths of the heart. And we turn to the Rebbein Shalom. Get me out of here. And the Rebbein Shalom, because the Rebbein Shalom is kind, the Rebbein Shalom takes us and he picks us up. And he takes us out of there, like Rabbi Shaina was saying, and paraphrasing. He picks us up and he takes us out of it. <coughs> so the question of death answers over there is, is the ha ha what happens to the Averis? <laughs> the Averis are there. You, the person did the Averis. How can you undo the Averis? Now, that's what says a Chiddush. He says that they, there's the, this Chesed of the Rebbein Shalom is such a great Chesed that it causes such a Kiddush Hashem that the Kiddush Hashem that's caused as a result of this Tshuva that the Rebbein Shalom grants us wipes out the Averis. It's phenomenal. Matona. It's a gift from the Rebbe So, we have a few more days just to recap. It's true that we may be stuck, but we can change. There's an Akudas Amos that we have to tap into that is change. And Rabbi Israel Salanta tells us that the best way to change is in the simple things, the things that we are constantly have the ability to do. And one of the things that we have the ability to do on a constant places, on a constant basis, is to be pleasant to the people around us, to be kind to the people around around us, to be in tune and in touch to the needs of the people around us. And it's not going to cost us anything. It's not a part of the cheshbon. And if we do this, if we employ these, these changes, 
when the Rebbeim Shalom will look upon us favorably and we will all be zeichet to be nechtav for nechtam l'chaim toivim l'shalom.